This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We're broadcasting from the Sundance Film Festival in Park City, Utah. The 2018 Academy Award nominations marks a historic first. Yancey Ford became the first trans director to be nominated for an Academy Award. His film, Strong Island, is up for Best Documentary. Ford is African American, chronicling what happened to his own family after his brother, William Ford Jr., was shot dead by a white mechanic in Long Island, New York, in 1992. The killer was questioned by police, but never charged. This is the trailer for Strong Island. You stumble out of the garage and into the yard where you fall. I said to the officer, where is my son? I want to be with my son. You lie on the ground, bullet through your heart, and know you will never see your sisters again, your mother, your father. That was the beginning. I did not feel that we were received as parents of a victim. Our blackness and how to survive being black in America was something that our parents instilled in us extraordinarily well. No officer spoke to me. No officer would look at me. You hear that your son is being investigated, and you grow more and more afraid. The police had turned my brother into the prime suspect in his own murder. Your father said to me, these are vicious people. Your son was shot down like a dog. This kid is going to actually get away with murder. I'm not willing to discuss any of my prior cases with anybody. My brother was not armed, not violent. In no way is his death justifiable. 23 white people will decide no crime has even been committed. It was like. All the sound left the world. I'm not willing to accept that someone else gets to say who William was. That's the trailer to Strong Island, which has just been nominated for an Academy Award for Best Documentary. We're joined now in New York by Democracy Now! video stream by the film's director, Yancey Ford, who worked on this documentary for a decade. We're also joined here in Park City at the Sundance Film Festival, where Yancey just was, by Jocelyn Barnes, who produced Strong Island. She's co-founder of Louverture Films with Danny Glover. Yancey Ford and Jocelyn Barnes, we welcome you both to Democracy Now! Yancey, first of all, Congratulations. You've not only uh, been nominated for an Oscar, but you have made history as the first trans director to ever be nominated by the Academy. Thank you, Amy, and good morning. Um, I am just I'm flabbergasted, I have to be honest with you. Um, Strong Island has been a labor of love and dedication um, on the part of so many people. Um, that it's it, it's just an, an incredible recognition to be honored um, and to be the first trans director and I believe the first African American trans director to be nominated for an Academy Award is incredibly incredibly special to me. I want to go to a video posted on Twitter on Tuesday oh, as the Oscar nominees were being announced. We were actually live broadcasting Democracy Now! Uh, here in uh, Park City. But this is how Yancey Ford and his partner reacted to the news. Icarus. Last man in Aleppo. Did they even say it? <laughs> so there is Yancey and his partner <laughs> responding to being named as an Oscar nominee. Um, well, Yancey, let's talk yeah. about this film and this journey you have taken that actually started 
long before you even started making the film. Yeah. First of all, tell us what Strong Island means, the title. Well, Strong Island is slang for Long Island, New York. Um, and it really grew out of what may surprise people. Um, it really grew out of the very vibrant hip hop scene um, that, um, you know, is located and, and, and still, you know, um, um, generates um, artists out of Long Island. Um, so Strong Island, you know, for, for kids, um, for hip hop heads, um, is a term that's always been used um, to refer to this place where um, kids from the city, um, you know, moved to the suburbs, but still wanted to hang on to, um, you know, I think a part of their urban heritage. So that's that's mm. where Strong Island that, that's where Strong Island comes from. And and tell us the story of your family. Um, talk about yeah. what happened in 1992 to your brother William. Well, in 1992, um, my brother um, and his girlfriend um, got into a car accident. Um, my brother negotiated, um, you know, with his girlfriend uh, and the mechanic who hit her car um, that the shop would, you know, repair it um, if uh, his girlfriend didn't report the accident to her insurance company or the police. Um, fast forward uh, about two and a half months later, um, my brother, on the night of April 7th, after my mother and his girlfriend picked up the car from the garage um, and brought it home, um, and were f followed home, frankly, by, um, you know, someone from the garage, um, he went to the garage to confront the owner, um, uh, a man named Tom Daytree Jr. Um, at some point um, during, um, you know, his confrontation with the owner, which wasn't physical, um, it was uh, actually a threat to um, come back to the garage when he became a law enforcement officer um, and to reveal what was going on at the place. It was a, it was a known chop shop um, and to shut the place down. Um, Mark Riley made himself um, visible to William. He walked out of the garage um, and, you know, William saw him and recognized him as the person who had cursed out my mother and his girlfriend on a, on a previous visit to the garage. Um, William, and, you know, he sort of comes out, goes right back in. William um, follows him, um, turns the corner, and essentially is shot. Um, and some, you know, stumbles back um, out into the yard where he sort of collides with his friend, Kevin, who heard the gunshot um, and ran toward William. Uh, he fell to the ground and essentially bled, um, bled to death internally um, by the time he got to uh, Stony Brook University Hospital. Um, Mark Riley was brought before a grand jury in August of that year, an all-white grand jury. And um, despite what um, people who have uh, been both inside and outside of prosecutor offices um, have told me about um, the case, they, you know, and their analysis of the case. Um, that grand jury declined to return an indictment. Um, and so Mark Riley went home without facing trial, um, and my family was left to um, essentially deal with the fallout and failure of this civic institution um, that we had all, you know, been raised to believe, you know, would work for us um, if we, you know, followed the old American rules, right? Like. You behave, you work, um, and you know, the justice system will work for you when you need it. And my brother's case 25 years ago simply affirms what we are seeing now, which is it doesn't matter if you follow the rules. The justice system isn't meant to work for, for people of color in this country. I want to go to another clip from Strong Island. Yancey, this is you, because you're mm. one of the subjects in the film countless number of times and all hours of the night during the summer after my brother was killed I could look outside the window and there was a car parked across the street that car and whoever was in that car was watching our house and trying to intimidate my parents the phone rang in the middle of the night every night for months when I was home, I unplugged all of the phones in the house. 
except for the one in my room, so that my parents could sleep through the night, so that they wouldn't have to pick up the phone and say hello and not have anyone respond, so that they wouldn't have to hang up the phone and go to the window and see the car sitting across the street. Having grown up in the South, where the cops and the Klan were one and the same, my parents didn't turn to the police for protection. They had already felt that the police had turned their own son into the prime suspect in his own murder. So, Yancy, that is you in the documentary. Uh, the mm -hmm. interviews with you, uh, with your sister, with your mother, are mm -hmm. heartbreaking, are so deeply profound as you talk about the death of your brother William, also um, the death of your family. But how did you go from the murder of your brother to the concept behind this documentary, what you wanted to convey with this. You also used it to investigate your brother's death. That's right. Um, you know, Amy, I think that there are very few people who intersect with issues so personally. Um, and I realized that that intersection, that my experience losing my brother and losing my family in the aftermath of his death, um, you know, I started making the, the film 15 years after he, you know, was killed. Um, and I decided that the narrative of his life had been completely rewritten by someone whose, you know, essentially whose freedom was at stake. By, um, and, and I needed to correct that, that record. I needed to, you know, reveal who William was, but I also needed to reveal the way in which he was essentially criminalized. Um, and so... What I decided to do um, with this film was to put black characters in the center of the frame and to have their experiences verified by themselves. There's no outside, you know, authority in this uh, film that says, yes, you're right, or these people are telling the truth. It was very important to me, conceptually, that the film be driven by black characters, because so often... Um, black people and brown people and folks who lose arm, unarmed loved ones to violence, they get shoved out of the way as if they are somehow, um, you know, unreliable witnesses to the lives of their dead. And in fact, the the people in the film, William's best, best friend, Kevin, who was with him the night that he was shot, Harvey, who knew him from Howard University, they are the most reliable people because they are they are able to talk about William in his full complexity, as opposed to reducing William to this stereotype, um, which, if you listen to the, the detective in the film, you would think that my brother was the Incredible Hulk, when really my brother was five feet, eight inches tall and described by the coroner as obese. So the, the entire, you know, the, the driving motive, one of the driving motives behind Strong Island is to reveal William as a whole, as a 360-degree character, including his faults. And by doing so, um, still saying, despite all of his faults, despite the fact that he might not have been the perfect black victim, this killing was still unlawful and should have gone to trial. Yancey Ford, um, you ask in this documentary, how do you measure the distance of reasonable fear? Explain. Um, well, reasonable fear is um, the concept that says you are justified in responding to a threat, um, you know, with deadly force if your life is at stake. Um, and it's the sort of the driving question of, you know, in the film, because, you know, New York is, is not actually a standard ground state. This is not one of of those those states, this, New York is a, is a state that is governed by laws of proportional force, right? So, for my brother to be unarmed um, and to confront a mechanic, and for him to you know shoot him, um, despite the fact that William didn't have a weapon, um, you know, is it raises the question of how deeply seated 
um, the fear of the black body is, the fear of black men is in our culture, so much so that a grand jury would believe that it was justifiable to shoot and kill an unarmed man when, you know, Mr. Riley had many other choices that night, and his choices weren't scrutinized. My brother's choices were scrutinized. And so I think it's important to, to um, interrogate how you measure reasonable fear and who gets to decide whose fear is reasonable. Because we see in these cases that more often than not, you know, the person who's, who has the justification or who has the historical fear, as Jocelyn um, has explained, um, you know, when talking about the film, you know, actually the historical fear belongs to the person of color who winds up dead, not to the white person who overreacts um, with deadly force in these situations. We're going to go to break, and then we're going to bring uh, we're going to bring Jocelyn Bards into the conversation. We're talking to Yancey Ford, who just made history, the first trans director, the first trans African American director as well, to be nominated for Academy Award. This is Democracy Now. We'll continue to talk about his documentary, Strong Island. Stay with us. This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman. We're broadcasting from the Sundance Film Festival in Park City, Utah. And as we broadcast our show on Tuesday, the Oscar nominations were announced. It was just about two-thirds of the way through the show, and it was there that we learned that Yancey Ford had made history, the first trans director to be nominated for an Academy Award for his film Strong Island. Um, we're also joined, in addition to Yancey Ford from his home in Queens, New York, we're joined by Jocelyn Barnes, the producer of Strong Island. I just asked Yancey that question, what is the measure of reasonable fear? Mm -hmm. um, use that as a launching point to talk about why you got involved, your um, film company, L'Overture Films, and the philosophy behind it. Thanks, Amy. Um, yeah, I think this is a, this is a really important aspect of the film. Um, this questioning of uh, what underpins self-defense cases and how racialized perception is intertwined with the justice system and who gets to decide what is reasonable fear, and then flipping that question, flipping that perspective, um, to talk about whose fear is actually reasonable from you know really bringing the historical element and bringing the, the, this, this question of loss and grief and, and entwining that in our own interrogation with history, with the historical weight of loss that has been the experience of the African-American community. I think our company um, was created to offer different perspectives, um, particularly perspectives that have been marginalized, but which, which are more and more important, which are more important than ever, I should say. Um, in, in today's uh, conversation. And Yancey is a truth-teller, <clears throat> and our relationship to the truth and who tells the truth, I think, has become even more important. Now, as Yancey made this film <clears throat> over a decade, um, m we more and more police killings were being made public. Oh. I won't say they increased. I'll say they g were getting more attention. Yeah. So you both decided to edit the film outside of the United States? Yeah, there was a point where Yancey had a cut uh, of the film. Yancey had been working on the film for four years when I came into the project and joined Yancey. Um, and we were in dialogue for about a year. He had put the, the film on hold for a while to decide how to reconceive the film. I, I think he felt that the film was sitting in the house of grief and that there was no place to move from grief. And so we made a decision to edit, to, to start the edit from scratch. Um, and there were killings, uh, you know, continuously. And we decided to leave the country and actually go overseas so that he could concentrate and fully focus on the creative element. We went to Denmark. There was a great editor who was available there at the time, Janis Biliskov Jensen, who had worked on the act of killing with Joshua Oppenheimer. And, um, uh, we decided that this was uh, Yancey and Yanis met for four days together, interrogated each other, and decided that they could work together. Um, and I think that that was a that was a very difficult decision to make and very risky decision to take. But I think that Yancey 
for me, it was important that Yancey want, was making the film that he wanted to make. And, you know, people, people refer to the film as personal. And I think that, of course, that is true. But, the per, you know, personal is also the language of the dispossessed in this case. Nobody wants to make a, make a film about the killing of their brother. Um, this is a, an artist who I think really understood that violence, you know, doesn't uh, confer what it promises and actually decided to use narrative and cinema to recuperate what was what was possible through through narrative, just really seize the field that way. Strong Island is about the killing of an African American man in Long Island, New York. The murder of an African American man by a white mechanic. Um, that man, the white mechanic, was never even charged. A central figure in this documentary is Yancey's mother. And I want to turn to a clip of Strong Island of Yancey's mom. Your father said to me, don't do anything to hurt my daughters. Don't do anything to hurt my girls. These are vicious people. Your son was shot down like a dog. You're not going to be with them always. I'm not with them always. The girls are all we have left. I wanted him to be angry. I wanted him to be outraged. I wanted him to... I wanted him to get a gun to avenge my son's death. He became silent. That's a clip from Yancey Ford's documentary, Strong Island. That's Yancey Ford's mother. Talk about your mother um, and how important she is to your family and to understanding what happened to William Ford, your brother, and what didn't happen to his murderer. You know, my mother is, is um, shown in the film in her kitchen, right, which is the center of our home and the center of, um, you, know, of you know, the place where I grew up. And contrary to what we often see um, you know, in in the news, right? Which is um, black people um, in in their state of grief, but not in the place where they are fully aware of an analysis of what is happening and the structural failures, um, and, an, and an analysis of the structural failure. My mother is wholly um, able to explain what happened to our family. She's wholly able to, um, you know. Uh, explain what she saw, um, you know, in the meetings with the DA and during her testimony before the grand jury. And her analysis was spot on. She wrote a letter to, you know, um, the, the district attorney saying um, that they hoped for a full, um, fair and impartial investigation because we, too, are the people. And that full, fair, and impartial investigation should have resulted in the case going to trial. It didn't. And when that happened, my mother was also able to say, you know, that she made the mistake of raising her children to believe that they should judge people by the content of their character rather than the color of their skin. And I think that that is probably one of the bravest things I've ever heard anyone say, and the fact that she happens to be my mother notwithstanding, because it tells the truth about America, where you cannot actually assume that you are safe with certain people. You cannot actually assume that someone does not have malintent, and you can't actually assume that someone doesn't actually have a murderous fear of you. Um, and that's why she's so powerful in the film, because even though she has lost her firstborn son, her only, um, her only son, um, 
she is still able to speak through that grief to a greater truth, which is her child should not have been lost without his right to due process being violated. And these incomplete investigations, these slipshod investigations, are actually a violation of due process for the dead, because the investigations are the only thing that can speak for them. Um, and by being able to, you know, talk about her entire experience, both critically and emotionally, my mother demonstrates that, you know, black and brown people are fully aware of the injustices with which we struggle and the structural failures that need to be addressed in our criminal justice system. I want to turn to another clip of your mom in Strong Island. This is Yancey Ford's mother speaking about the loss of her son, William. I thought that I could comfort your father or in that he would comfort me. But he turned his back. I will over, over, and um, he, he couldn't go any further. He couldn't go any further. So I got up and I walked around the bed and I got in front of him. I just said, it's not your loss, it's our loss. We together created this child. God granted him to us for these years. <laughs> you can't grieve an issue that came from my body and shut me up. And we both cried. He embraced me. And we both cried. And that's how we went to sleep. Yancey Ford, this is your mother in Strong Island. But in interviewing your mother, what did you learn about her that you didn't know in all the years of living with her and knowing her? You know, I learned so much about my mother throughout making uh, this film. I think that one of the things, though, or the most important thing that I learned about her was that this thing, you know, this sort of demand from my parents that my brother, sister, and I love each other no matter what. Um, you know, they used to say, we're not going to be here someday. And when we're gone, you guys are, you know, you, you're the only, you, you are the only family you will have. And the fact that she not only, you know, taught us and, and, and instilled in us and my, my father as well, this notion of unconditional love, the fact that that love, you know, carried her through 20 years of grief, love for my sister and I, um, you know, the fact that her love for my father began in the sixth grade, and the fact that the, the, her love for my brother was as present in each interview as it was if he were still alive. She was this amazing, um, she was this amazingly eloquent woman who ultimately believed in the power of love to heal. But this was the one thing this, this injustice was the thing that love couldn't actually heal. I think that she was glad to have the opportunity to speak her truth to power, but love wasn't enough to repair the breach with our civil society. And seeing her um, disappointment and knowing how deeply it affected her, um, that was... It was, it was a difficult thing, but also knowing that she was a woman who, who felt loved deeply and who was deeply loved um, it was an incredible thing to, to see and an incredible gift that, you know, she gave to me. Yancy, as we wrap up, you transitioned after making this documentary. And I was wondering if you can talk about 
that process? Mm. You know, Amy, actually, my, my transition um, was in, in progress um, while I was making the film. Um, and, you know, I, I had top surgery, I think, three years ago this month, actually. Um, and I've, I've always been gender nonconforming. I, you know, identified as a butch lesbian um, when I was in my early 20s, even though I, you know, didn't encounter the word transgender um, until 1995 when I met uh, Minnie Bruce Pratt. Um, so, you know, transitioning um, sort of in my public, you know, in my private life is something that had been, you know, had been ongoing. Um, and the tricky thing about making a film when you're, you're, when you're a character, right, is that, I, you know, you can't actually have your voice change in the middle of, of post-production because, you know, I, I, I might need to record, you know, additional um, lines or re-record things. So um, I, I, I didn't, you know, um, you know, begin hormones until um, after the picture was locked. But, you know, I had the, you know, the there's no turning back from here. Um, you know, as the medical establishment tries to, you know, make trans people go through these steps just in case you change your mind. You know, that for me was was the was the easy part. Um, and, you know, being the first trans director, um, you know, nominated for an Academy Award, um, you know, having gone through a process with people who embraced me regardless of how I identified you know, with, with people who were able to turn on a dime um, and use the proper pronouns and respect um, my gender identity, um, even though it's been something, you know, it's not new to me, it's not new, um, you, know, you know, to the to the people that I hold dear, but it's sort of new in the public space. Um, you know, having that embraced and being respected, um, you know, by my creative team, you know, as that process played itself out, was tremendously important um, because, you know, that respect um, you know, for both, you know, me as an artist and, and me as, as someone who um, was coming to a new understanding of how I wanted to be in the world, right, which is, which is my true self, my authentic self, um, and, and being that authentic self and being out um, as my authentic self is so important. Um, and it's, um, it's one of the reasons why I'm so proud of Strong Island, because the film stands on its own. Um, and also allows, um, you know, it to go into communities where it might not uh, might not otherwise go, um, because of who I am, right? Like, I I know that trans people of color are murdered at such rates, you know, in this country every year, and it it should be treated as you know a law enforcement priority, but it's not. And you know, if my nomination can um, can help in any way. Um, you know, uh, to advance the issues of, of trans equality um, and, and protection for um, LGBTQ people under the law, then, you know, I'm, I'm as humbled by that um, as I am by the nomination. Yancey Ford, I want to thank you so much for being with us. And again, congratulations you, for making history in different ways, because this documentary, Strong Island, is historic. Um, Yancey Ford, the first trans director to be nominated for an Academy Award for his film, Strong Island. He's received many awards for it so far, his debut film, including the 2017 Special Jury Award for Storytelling at the Sundance Film Festival. It was the most awarded documentary of 2017. And I want to thank Jocelyn Barnes, who will stay with us, because uh, Strong Island debuted last year here at the Sundance Film Festival. This year, another remarkable film, Hale County, this morning, this evening. We'll talk about that next with Ramel Ross and Jocelyn Barnes. Stay with us.